Well, let me take a moment to welcome all of our campuses. I want to welcome our Callaway campus, as well as our Panama City Beach campus, Panama City campus, and all of those who are joining us online today here at North Star. We're incredibly excited that you're with us, and uh, we are live again at all of our campuses. And so I want us to take a moment and put our hands together, and let's welcome each other. So glad to have all the campuses with us today. Very, very excited that you're with us. Man, I'm excited because we're kicking off a brand new series entitled How Sweet the Sound, where over the next four weeks together, we're going to look at some of the old hymns that many of us grew up with. And we're not just going to look at the hymn, but we're going to look at the theology and the concept behind the hymn. The hymn that we're going to look at today is probably one of the most impactful hymns in all of Christian history. It's the hymn Amazing Grace. The words were penned by a man many, many years ago. We're going to talk about that here in just a few moments. But the way that I would like to kind of get into this message today is for you to complete some common phrases with me that we oftentimes hear and that oftentimes many of us say together. The first phrase is just simply this phrase. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. That's right. It is. It probably is, all right? What about this? We make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. There you go. We, we earn it. Then what about this one? There's no such thing as a free. There you go. Okay. Some people said lunch. Some people said, you know, uh, something else, but that's right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And then here's the last one. There's no gain without pain. That's right. Pain is always involved when it comes to being able to move forward. And then here's one more. God helps those who who helps themselves, right? And some people believe that's in the Bible, but it is not. That is not in the Bible. Now, why would I have you say those phrases? It's simply because of this. Because everything about the American life teaches us that you get what you earn in life. And isn't it true that in the American way of life, we always say that there's no free lunch, that you make your bed, then you're ultimately going to lie in it? And when we talk about life, we always talk about getting what you earn and getting what you deserve. And we always are saying things like, you've got to work hard, you've got to use elbow grease, you've got to give all of your effort, because if you really want to be able to move forward in life, you've got to give everything that you've got, because you get what you earn in this life. And the danger of that is just simply this. This is called the American work ethic. And it's the way that many of us live our lives, and it's how we believe that life should be lived. But the only problem with the American work ethic is that it makes it difficult to understand grace, even, if the, uh, even to be able to extend grace towards others. In fact, don't miss this next statement. God does not operate on the American work ethic. You see, we think he does, but he doesn't. And let me tell you, it's important to understand this because it makes it difficult many times for us to relate to God because we are driven by this work mentality. And so when you use a word like grace, and we say this word all the time, it oftentimes loses its power and its value. The problem is found in Psalm 145, verse 8. It tells us that God, rather than being in a work ethic mode, it says that God is completely different. In fact, I want you to look at the scripture with me. It says, the Lord is, say that word out loud together, gracious, that's right. A little bit louder at Panama City Beach there, you know. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and rich in love. God is a gracious God. He is a loving God. And God doesn't work according to the American ethic. In fact, I would encourage you in your message notes to circle that word gracious there uh, in that passage of Scripture because that's what we're going to talk about, the importance of grace and how gracious God is to each and every one of us. The Bible says that God is so gracious. That means that his love, he loves to be gracious. He loves to lavish grace upon you, and he loves to lavish grace upon me. That is the nature of God. That is exactly who he is. And the very reason that we exist is because of God's grace. And the reason we love and we're able to be loved is because God was gracious to every single one of us. And this week as I was thinking about grace, I was thinking to myself, every breath that I breathe is just a testimony of the grace of God. And every moment that I'm alive is a testimony of God's grace. And every moment that I experience goodness in my life is just a testimony of how good God is and how much God loves me. 
And you see, that is God's nature. And I don't know about you, but I am glad that God is a gracious God. I'm glad that God doesn't give me what I deserve and that God doesn't give me what what is coming to me, so to speak. But God is good to me and he's gracious to me. And I think that many of you probably are so thankful for the grace of God in your own life personally. Speaking of the grace of God, let me just tell you a true story about a man that was born in 1725. He struggled massively in his life. In his early 20s, he worked on a slave ship. He was the worst of the worst, according to history, as a human being. In fact, many that worked on the boat with him called him one of the greatest blasphemers of God. They could not believe like how immoral he was. He was not only immoral, he was a raging drunk, he was hateful, he cussed like a sailor. I mean, he was a sailor, but he cussed like a sailor. Uh, he was a captain, and his captain used these words to describe him. His captain said this, he said, not only did he use the worst language ever that I've heard, Quote, here's what he says. He created new words that exceeded the limits of verbal debauchery. He's like, this guy was just so hated by everyone. He was so hated that one time in a storm, he fell overboard, and immediately his shipmates began to throw harpoons at him. They literally wanted to kill him. They hated him. He was disobedient to his captain. Uh, In fact, he was stripped one time. He was flogged eight dozen lashes in front of 350 men. He became so angry and he was so infuriated on the inside to be humiliated in front of other people that he decided he was going to kill the captain. He was going to take the captain's life. And then he was going to take his own life. But something happened. In the middle of this journey, a storm blew in and the storm was very, very vicious. In fact, one of the guys, the only guy on the ship that really liked him or cared anything about him went overboard. He found himself all of a sudden left all alone and he began to cry out to God for the very first time in his life. He said, Lord, have mercy on us all. God save us. And God did. Every single one of them lived. He started to read the Bible and all of a sudden he had an encounter with Jesus Christ and his life was changed. In 1772, John Newton not only was changed, but he became a minister. And John Newton penned these words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I've often wondered why he used the word wretch, but now I understand. He thought of himself as a wretch. He thought of himself as somebody that was so horrible. He became a person who hated slavery because Jesus had changed his heart. He hated the things that he had done in his life. He says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did this grace appear the hour I first believed. Beautiful words. But do we really understand them? Do we really know what grace is all about? Because you cannot understand the Christian life and what it means to be a follower of Jesus without truly understanding what grace is. Grace is at the heart of Christianity. Grace is at the heart of, grace is at the heart of God. And when you understand grace, let me just tell you what begins to happen in your life. You become free to live in a way that you've never lived before. Your life is full of joy and happiness because you're free to live, free to live in the grace of God. You see, you're going to feel closer to God. The more you understand grace, you're going to be drawn to God because you begin to see him in a different light and understand him in a different way. The more you understand grace, the more you're going to love God and you're going to realize how really compassionate he is and gracious he has been to you as an individual. The more you're going to be grateful to God for his goodness in your life. You see, it's by the system of grace that God has extended his love to each and every one of us. It's by the system of grace that each and every one of us have not only been able to have an encounter with God, but we're able to know God. One definition of grace, and I'm going to give you three before we dive into kind of some of the application today, but one definition of grace is this. It's God's love in action. God's love in action. I like this next definition. I wrote this one down. It's God giving me what I need, not what I deserve. 
Now think about that just for a second. God giving me what I need, not what I deserve. Now I don't know about you. For some of you, this may be hard to stomach. You're like, I came to church today to be encouraged. But guys, let me tell you something. When we really understand who we are, we realize how little we do deserve. I mean, when I understand how sinful I can be and how bad of a person I am and how wicked my heart can be, I begin to realize that I really don't even deserve to take the next breath to live this life that I have here. But it's hard for us to think about ourselves in that context because the American way says to us, you get what you deserve. You've pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. You've made it on your own. You've done it by yourself. You don't need anyone else. And when you think about your relationship with God, many of us oftentimes think that we've earned a right before God. That we have made our way. God, look at me and what I've done and how nice I am and how kind I am to others and what I give and what I do. God, look at me. And God doesn't look at that. God looks at the heart. I love this definition. This is probably my favorite definition of grace. Grace is the face God wears when he looks at my failures. Grace is the face that God wears when he looks at my failures. I think John Newton knew this when he penned these words. I think in his own life, that's why he was able to say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. God saw my failures. He knew the things that I had done wrong. He knew what my life was like. And you've got to understand the difference between grace and mercy because God is a God of grace. And so what I want to do today just for a few moments is I want to use the acrostic grace, G-R-A-C-E, and talk about what grace is. And what I hope to do today, uh, before we sing this beautiful, wonderful song together, I hope to challenge and to inspire you to look at grace in a way that you've never looked at it before. Let's begin together. The first letter that we're going to look at is the letter G, and it just simply means this. Grace is God's gift to me. Grace is God's gift to me. In Romans 3, verse 24, listen to what it says. It says, All of us need to be made right with God by his grace, which is a free gift through Jesus Christ. It emphasizes that it's a gift. It's something that is given to us. And have you ever noticed that anytime somebody offers a gift to you, what do you have to do in order to receive that gift? What do you you have to do? You have to take it. You have to reach out and grab a hold of it. I could tell you today, I could stand up here on stage and say, I've got a $500 gift certificate for you. Now, you can believe that or not believe that, but if I had it in a gift box and I said, this is a $500 gift card, what would you have to do? You would have to come up here, you would have to take it, and by faith, you'd have to receive it, believing that it was exactly what I said that it was going to be. You see, because of the American work ethic, it's hard for us to not think that it's a gift that is given to us. We want to think that we work for it or that we can be good enough or that we can earn it in some way. But the reality is we would never be able to earn this free gift that God offers. In fact, this week I was thinking about this. If you were to ask 15 uh, or if you were to ask 50 to 100 people along the sidewalk or the roadway, how do you get to heaven? You would find all kinds of answers. In fact, I wrote some of these down. I want you to just think about what people would say. People would say, be good and do your best. That's how you get to heaven. Be a good moral person. Because if you're morally good, then, then God, will, God will honor you because you're a good moral person. Do more good things than bad things. Make sure your good pile is bigger than your bad pile, and you'll ultimately make it to heaven. And that's what people think. They think, I can just earn my way there. If I'm just better than my friend over here, or if I'm better than that that guy down the street that nobody really likes, then then ultimately I'm going to make it to heaven. I'm going to get there, but it's God's gift. It's not about being good. It's not about doing the right things. It's a gift of grace that God gives to each and every one of us. And guys, here's what's important. If you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear this. The reason that this is fundamentally important is because Christianity is different than every other religion because of this word. You don't believe that, I would challenge you. Every other faith and every other belief system, I don't care if it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, whatever religion you want to look at, the idea behind every other religion is based on the word do. It's what you do to get yourself to heaven. 
It's how good of a person you can be. It's what you do. What will you do? How often will you pray? How much money will you give? How, how, how good are you to others? Morally, what is your standing as far as you as an individual? And you do certain things in order to gain bliss or to gain heaven or to get yourself right with God. And on the other hand, if you were to summarize Christianity, Christianity is one word, D-O-N-E, done. God has done everything through grace in Christ Jesus. You don't have to do nothing. It's a free gift that God offers to you. He offers to each and every one of us. And so when we begin, we begin to think about grace. We think about grace. Grace is what? Grace is God's gift to me. The second thing I want you to write down is R, and that is, how do you get grace? You receive it by faith. You receive it by faith. When you think about grace, it's God's gift, but it has to be received by faith. In fact, Paul talked about this. He said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Listen to the words that he shared. He said, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And he says, and this is not from yourselves. He's talking about even the faith we have to be able to believe. He says, that doesn't come from you. It's a gift that comes from God. He says, it is the gift of God, not by works. And notice what Paul does. He says, you can't work for it. You can't earn it. The American way may say you earn it, but Paul says no. You'll never be able to work hard enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be able to do all of the right things. You can't earn it so that no one can boast. You see, none of us will be able to get to heaven and say, guess what I did? I mean, think about what heaven would be like if we could all boast about how we got there, right? I mean, you ever thought about that? You talk about a crazy place. I mean, we would all be there bragging about, look at me and what I did in order to get here. I mean, if you could brag about getting to heaven, listen, there would be no need for Jesus. And that's exactly what God wants us to understand. That grace is this free gift that is offered to each and every one of us and it is received by faith. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, people receive God's promise by having faith. This happens so the promise can be a free gift. It's just offered to you. God says, hey, if you'll just believe in my son Jesus, that he was who he said he was, that he did what he said he was going to do, and that he was resurrected for you so that you could have eternal life. Your life can be changed today, and every one of us can experience this grace that God offers to us. People receive God's promise. And I would circle that word promise because it's a promise that God gives to each and every one of us. People receive God's promise by having faith. This happens so that the promise can be a free gift. So God made a promise. He said that he would offer to us eternal life. And by grace, he gave us this free gift. The A stands for that this grace we're talking about is available to everyone. It's available to everyone. You see, there's probably people on your list that you would say, they don't deserve grace. I mean, think about it just for a moment. All of us have our list, right? I mean, every one of us go, I, 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 you don't know this guy, or you don't know this girl, or you don't understand what they did to me or to my family, or you don't understand what they did to, 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 to the world around us, right? And, and there are people in your mind that you think, they just don't deserve God's grace. Let me tell you something about God. God doesn't play favorites. Regardless of what your background, regardless of your status, regardless of your sin, God never plays favorites. God loves each and every one of us. You're thinking to yourself, Marty, but how could God love, and you fill in the blank, you have someone in your mind. God loves them and he cares about them. In fact, in Romans 14, 16, listen to what it says. The promise is not only for those people that live under the law of Moses, it is for anyone who lives, um, I'm sorry, who lives with faith like Abraham. Now, what was he saying here when, when Paul wrote these words? He was saying the promise first came to the Jews, the Jewish people. They were God's chosen people. And if you remember, it was through that Jewish nation, the Jewish people, that God wanted to spread his love to the rest of the world. And then God in Christ, what did he do? He opened this up to Gentiles, those of us who were not Jews, to say in Christ, this is for everyone, for every single person. 
And God, through his amazing love, said that if anyone, like Abraham, would just have faith, that they would be saved and they could have eternal, um, eternal life. Have you ever thought about why God called the Jews his chosen people? Is it because he loved them more than he loved us? No, it's because he chose them to be the nation through which he would show his grace and his mercy and his kindness. It's so sad to me to think today that even many of us, we often don't thank God enough for his grace. We're not grateful for what he really has done in our lives, for what he has given us. I mean, I don't know how many of you believe this, but I believe for many of us that live in America, it's a gift. God has been so gracious to us, especially when you travel to other parts of the world. We're in the top 1% of wage earners in the entire world. It's amazing to me how God has blessed us. Grace, grace that is extended and given. God not giving me what I deserve, but giving me what I do not deserve. God has been so gracious to me. And then the C stands for uh, grace, that grace comes through Christ. That grace comes through Christ. It's the idea that, that the grace that we experience and the grace that we have comes through Jesus. You see, if there had been any other way, God would have done it. But Christ was the only way. That's why Jesus separated history. That's why he's the one that ultimately made everything new. In fact, in John 1, 17, it says this. It says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, the law was given to show us how far and how short of God's goodness and grace we really do fall. And then the Jewish uh, leaders of that day, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, what did they do? They started adding on all these rules and regulations. And it was amazing when Jesus showed up on the scene. I mean, I can't imagine in my mind what it was about Jesus that was so different than everybody else. But as you follow the New Testament, you begin to realize what was different about Jesus and everyone else was his grace. Now, this may not make sense to you, but I want you to think about it just for a second. Uh, I was reading a book by Chuck Swindoll called uh, Grace Awakening. And he says, have you ever noticed that some people, they just have a no face and some people have a yes face? I mean, you look at some people and you just know the answer is going to be no. You don't even ask, right? You just go, no, that's a no face. But then there's some people, they just got a yes face, right? I mean, you, you just know. My daughter has a, a little dog and um, uh, his, his name is Patches. And he knows that I'm the yes face in the family. And, and it always amazes me that we can all be sitting around and everybody have the same thing in their hand as far as food is concerned. And who is the one guy that he comes to? He comes to me. Because he knows that, I call him my grandpa, but he knows that, that grandpa is going to give him something more than, more than anybody else. Angela's like, no. Ashley's like, no. Dad, don't do it. And as soon as they turn their head, I give him something, right? And so he's like, that's the yes face. He's gracious. I know he's gracious. I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm getting what I don't deserve. And you know what? Jesus was a yes face. I remember the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. And the religious leaders of the day were right. They said, you know what? The law says that we should stone her. And they bring her in front of Jesus and they, they place her because they had caught her in the act of adultery. And you can imagine the reputation that this woman had. And they place her in front of Jesus and they say, Jesus, this woman by law, because that's what we're talking about, right? The law says that she is to be stoned. Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus said, the one of you without sin cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, one by one, everybody began to drop their stones and they walked away. And in a moment of stillness and quietness, this woman and Jesus are by themselves. And Jesus uses two phrases. He says to her, he says, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. A yes face. Grace. It's the same thing that God says to you and that God says to me today. Marty, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, what we have to understand is that grace, grace what? Grace comes through Christ. In fact, it says many people have received God's gift of life by the grace of one man, that man being Jesus Christ. You see, God knew that we were going to sin he knew that we were never going to be able to live up to the perfection that we needed to live to to be accepted by him. 
And so God sent his son, Jesus, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to give his life so that we could have life. And that is why with Christianity, it separates us from every other religion in the world because we believe that Jesus is the one that provided the grace for each and every one of us. It's only by grace that we can be saved. I want you to notice this last one. It's extended throughout eternity. Grace is extended throughout eternity. This is absolutely astounding to me when you think about it. Grace comes through Christ, but then it is extended throughout eternity. In Romans 6, verse 23, it puts it like this. It says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, what we deserved is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. All throughout eternity, God extends his grace to us. See, he created us not just to live for 80 or 100 years here on earth. He created us to live throughout all of eternity. And what he says to us is that there is this gift that is extended to each and every one of us throughout all of eternity. I don't know about you, have you ever thought about heaven, but heaven is going to be a wonderful place. And I want you to just think about this, because when you think about eternity, heaven's a place of reunion where you're reunited with your loved ones who have accepted the grace of God. It's not goodbye, but it's one day we're going to see you again. It's a place of reward. We're going to be rewarded for our character that we've developed on this planet as we've lived and we've served other people. It's going to be a place where we are reassigned to do work as we live out and do what God has shaped each and every one of us to do. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. It's going to be a place of release where we're free from all the pain and all the suffering and all the sadness and all the sorrow and all the grief and all the depression and all the loneliness. Why? Because of grace. Because of God's amazing, astounding grace. And I believe that when John Newton penned these words... And he began to to sing this song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He saw himself for who he was. And he knew that it was only by the grace of God that his life had been changed. I pray today that you will understand grace in a greater way. Because as you do, you'll love God deeper than you've ever loved him before. Your life will be different because of the way that you begin to live and how you extend grace towards others because you begin to understand it. My prayer through this series is as we look at some of these old hymns together, the theology and the sacredness of what was written would come alive in your heart and you would begin to live differently because of what God has done for you through his incredible grace. Let's pray together. As we pray across all of our campuses, I'm going to ask that we go ahead and raise the screens. And as the screens are going up, I want us to just bow our heads just for a moment. And I want you to think about the words of this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you really understand who you are? Do you understand what God has done for you through Christ? Do you see the grace and the mercy and the love that has been extended to you? And in a moment when we stand together to sing, I want you to sing this song with a passion like you've never sang before because you understand the incredible grace that God has extended to you in your life. For those of you that are followers of Jesus, I would encourage you in this moment, would you just say to God how thankful you are for his grace? Would you just tell him, would you just say, God, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for what you've done in my life. But then I believe there are others of you that have never experienced this grace. You've never saw yourself as a sinner and separated from God. And you've never received his gift, his son Jesus, as grace for you to be able to live eternally. And if you've never done that, I want you to make the best decision of your life today. Right now, in this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to receive God's grace. You say, Pastor Marty, what do I have to do? The Bible says it this way. It says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so right where you are, you can begin to believe by just simply praying a prayer, something like this in your heart. 
Just say these words to God. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I believe that I have sinned against you. And I thank you, God, today that I heard this message of your incredible grace. And by faith, in the best way that I can, I receive the gift of your son, Jesus. And I ask him to come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, God, for being gracious towards me. Help me to live the Christian life now in the best way that I can. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And I want to pray for you as we close our service. And so at all of our campuses, I'm going to ask you, if you just prayed that prayer with me, with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, would you just raise your hand for me? Just hold it up there just for a second. There you go. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Someone else. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. At your campuses, we see your hands today, your campus pastor. For those of you that are online right below me, there's a hand there. You can click on that. And I just want to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for every single person today that has said yes to you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we pray, God, that as we stand to sing this song together, that, God, we would sing it in a way we have never sang it before because of your amazing grace. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand together and we're going to sing this song.